Well, Roxy, thank you very much, and certainly want to thank Metro Techs for taking the initiative to put on a webinar like this to really talk a little bit about what, what a reverse mortgage is, what they are, frankly, what they are not, talk about the reverse mortgage for purchase initiative that was passed on November the 5th in the constitutional amendment election, because at the end of the day, when we talk about reverse mortgages, uh, there's a lot of misperceptions sometimes about what a reverse mortgage is, and then there's certainly some questions as to uh, what the election did in November and how your realtor clients can learn more about reverse mortgages and hopefully uh, give them an opportunity. So when we talk about reverse mortgages, the first thing we, we talk about is are the safety features, really. And we, when we talk about reverse mortgages, we're dealing with somebody's mom and dad, we're dealing with somebody's grandparents, and so there are always some confusions and certainly some misperceptions out there on what a reverse mortgage is, because it seems if you're anything like me, every time you turn on the TV or you read a newspaper, you hear about some sort of a senior scam or somebody taking advantage of Mimi and Papa. And so, you know, I think we want to talk about that on the offset. Let's, let's, let's get that out in the open. There are some misperceptions about reverse mortgages. Unfortunately, there's some urban legends. And so hopefully this webinar can talk to you about the facts about reverse mortgages, not really get into the opinions, but let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about the people that do these and how it can benefit you and your, your realtor base. So when you really talk about reverse mortgages, this first slide right here, this is probably the most important slide you'll have in the entire day. And so that's why I bring this up first because it's the most important thing I can show you. We did an open records request with the Texas Department of Savings and Mortgage Lending, who in essence is the TREC equivalent for the mortgage industry. And we asked them a very simple question. How many enforcement actions have been made by their department re regarding complaints involving reverse mortgages in the past six years? And the answer to that is zero. Now think about that. In the last six years in the state of Texas, the Texas Department of Savings and Mortgage Lending has not had one boogeyman, one problematic reverse mortgage issue where they had to issue an enforcement action. Now if you ask the same question about home equity lenders or 30-year fixed rate lenders, clearly I think everybody thinks they're gonna be more than zero. So this is important. This is not my opinion. This is a letter from the chief mortgage regulator in the state of Texas saying from their vantage point, they have not had any problems with reverse mortgages. That to me is very, very important. And it's why I really start this webinar off with this issue, because I want you to understand exactly what a reverse mortgage is. So when you really get into this, as you know, on November the 5th, there was a constitutional amendment election. And so in essence, what the legislature did is they really reviewed the entire reverse mortgage process. Very rarely do you have an entire mortgage product that is reviewed by the Texas legislature. And we were reviewing this to do two things. One, we were trying to strengthen reverse mortgage lending in the state of Texas, make them harder for lenders to make these loans, easier for the consumers. And we were also looking to extend reverse mortgages to add what we call a reverse mortgage for purchase product. But I think it's important that before we start talking about reverse mortgage for purchase, we talk about exactly what a reverse mortgage is. But in this, we had two public hearings. We had a hearing in the Senate that was chaired by John Corona out of Dallas, who was a Republican senator. We had another hearing that was chaired in the House by a Democrat from San Antonio by the name of Mike Villarreal. So this was a bipartisan piece of legislation it's important to note that this was the second committee. The witness list we have here is the House Committee on Investments for Financial Investments and Financial Services. And in it, you can see who testified for this legislation, who testified on expanding reverse mortgages. I, the first name on here, as you'll see, is the Texas Association of Realtors. Clearly, TAR has been a great advocate for your industry in making sure that the lenders are really held in line, but I bring this up, Texas Association of Realtors, Texas Mortgage Bankers Association. You'll see my name on here. I don't bring that up to necessarily impress you, but to impress upon you that this is something that I've been working on now for five years. 
and I was fortunate enough to testify in the House and the Senate on this issue. The Alliance for Texas Families, clearly that is a pro-consumer group, not a pro-business group. Texas Land Title Association, once again, the Texas Bankers Association, Daniel Gonzalez with TAR, uh, another Scott Norman with the Texas Association of Home Builders, AARP. I bring that up because this is important. AARP clearly is probably the number one advocate nationally for seniors, and yet AARP testified to expand reverse mortgages in Texas. The Independent Bankers Association of Texas and then once again the Texas Association of Realtors. I bring that up because if you look at the next line, those who testified against expanding and strengthening reverse mortgages in the state of Texas, not one person, not one group, not one entity testified against strengthening these. So when you look at the fact that we have a really a stellar track record with the regulators, and then you look at the consumer groups and the business groups around Texas who are paid to make sure that legislation is passed and it's passed properly. We had significant support here. Not one person testified against us. And then if you go to the Senate, every member of the Senate voted for this. Everyone, 31 to 0. And in the House, we were uh, fortunate to win by 139 to 1. So not only did the consumer groups support us, but the legislature supported this by a vote of 170 to 1. That's important because a lot of different eyeballs, a lot of different opinions, a lot of different political affiliations looked at this and supported it. So it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you live in East Texas or West Texas, in the Metro Tex area, it doesn't matter. Various groups from around the state looked at this and said, we think reverse mortgages are a good idea, and we think it is something we need to expand. And then on November the 5th, we had a constitutional amendment election, and we won by basically you know, 275,000 votes. So I bring that up in the standpoint of when you start looking at this issue, not only did we win, but we also had the endorsement of every major newspaper in the state of Texas. So the point I'm trying to make is when you start really talking about reverse mortgages, the most important thing I can tell you today is the safety. The safety of these, the safety for your clients, the safety for your parents, the safety for your grandparents, because you may or may not be active in the reverse mortgage for purchase business, but when you really start talking about reverse mortgages and dealing with seniors and trying to monetize their home equity, this is something that probably affects somebody in your family. Maybe not today, maybe not for a year or two, but everyone has an aunt or an uncle or a grandfather who's in a house who could really look at some different ways to monetize their home equity and make their retirement a little bit better. So quickly, when we talk about reverse mortgages, I just want to briefly touch the fact that all reverse mortgages are based in the Texas Constitution. We've actually amended the Constitution now five separate times. And most people are familiar with home equity lending. You'll have a home equity loan, which is a, a, a six loan. You may hear that phrase. That's where it is in the Constitution. A reverse mortgage is an A7 loan. So a reverse mortgage, if you will, is the cousin to the, to the traditional home equity loan. Now, I'll talk a lot about home equity as it relates to reverse mortgages, but in that sense, but technically speaking, a reverse mortgage is not a home equity loan. It's the cousin, I may use it as a home equity uh, phrase, but just remember that a home equity loan that you can go get at your local bank is different than a reverse mortgage home equity loan, if you will. The other factor that is very critical on the reverse mortgage is that it's a non-recourse loan. I bring that up because it is critical that people realize that at no time that mom and dad would ever take out a reverse mortgage and leave their children or leave their heirs with their obligations. That is in the Constitution, it's ironclad, and it is a non-recourse loan. So your children, your heirs, everyone is protected. No one is going to have a, a significant bill sent to the, to the kids. Now, why, is, why are you on this call? Why, why are reverse mortgages important to Texas? And why is it critical that people around the country and around the state learn more about reverse mortgages? 
Here is a slide from Social Security, and this is Social Security Bulletin 72 that was issued early, early last year. And in it, it says that as it relates to individuals that own a 401k or an IRA, 63% of the United States does not own an IRA or a 401k. Now, that is a staggering number as it relates to the fact that Texas is going to continue to grow. There's going to be continued burdens on seniors. It is expensive to grow old in America, and yet 63% really has no organized savings. They may have something in savings, they may have something in their checking account, but as it relates to a, an organized 401k or an IRA, 63% are not remotely prepared for retirement. Now that is a scary number. Now that number does not include the pension, but it does give you an idea of how far away we are from being prepared as a state for retirement. Another staggering number, and this is per AARP, and they will tell you that over 40%, the actual number is 42%, but over 40% of the state's 65-year-old and older population would have incomes below the poverty line if they did not receive their Social Security. So think about that. When you think about everybody in the state of Texas age 65 and over, two out of every five Texans would literally live below poverty if not for their Social Security. Now that is just a, an amazing number and a very depressing number because if we don't start looking at retirement as a legitimate crisis in the state of Texas, we're going to have additional burdens on state and local governments that we simply can't pay for. Now, over the last legislative session, there was lots of conversation about water. There was lots of conversation about transportation. And, and certainly that's, that's, that's correct and it should have been that way. But the other aspect that the legislature really took up and considered was really this issue of a retirement crisis in Texas. The state of Texas, because of energy, has been very, very fortunate that we've made a lot of money and we have, we are in a great financial situation. But the average Texan, your neighbors, the people you deal with, most of those people are ill, repa Ill prepared for retirement. And so that's why we start talking about this. Here's another slide that is really staggering that, that shows you a little bit about how quickly Texas is aging. Texas historically has always been a very young state, but Texas is going to age and become a very older state in our business lifetime. In the year 2040, that's not that far off. You can look at the number of counties that have it's basically 20% or more or 15% or more of the entire population age 65 and over. Now, if you look at the slide on the left in the year 2000, you almost just can eyeball it. You see a lot of reds and a lot of yellows. And then if you look at the slide on 2040, you see lots and lots of blues and lots of greens. Very few reds and very few yellows. Certainly the DFW area, if you look at that, you do have a couple of yellows. But if you look at where we were in the year 2000, almost that entire area had a population below 12% of those population of those aged 65 and over. So you can almost just eyeball it and realize Texas is going to grow significantly in the next 20 to 30 years. And we already have a retirement crisis today because people are ill prepared for retirement. And it doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. The problem is it's expensive to live, it's expensive to save, and it's hard enough to make ends meet as it is much less having to put something in your 401k or your IRA to get you down the road. So I bring these slides up because there is a retirement crisis and we need to start looking at various new options. And what one of those options is the ability to monetize home equity and look at it in a very different sense. Because we know a couple of things. We know that a majority of American homeowners in or near retirement have most of their net worth tied up in their home. We think that we know that number is north of 50%. We also know that the average American has less than two years saved for retirement. Some, you know, depending on where you look, may say hey, they have three, may, may have four, but the average American has less than two years saved for retirement, a majority of whom, of, of that group, have less than one year saved. 
So knowing that we have a retirement crisis, knowing that there is so much equity in your house, why are we not talking about home equity in the context of retirement planning? Now, please know I'm not talking about home equity in the context of investing. I'm absolutely not suggesting anybody access their home equity to go invest in stocks. But I do think that we should look at our number one asset, our number one resource, and that is our home, that is our home equity, to look at retirement in a different way. Now, that's frustrating for a lot of people because if you're anything like me, I can assure you my father would always say, your house is your home, you never borrow your home equity, your home should be paid off before you retire, and that's a great safety net. Well. He was right in that sense. In a perfect world, you would like that. But at some point, if you're drawing down your IRA, your 401k, more than that 3 or 4% annually that you should be doing, you simply are not going to have the funds needed to have a 15 or a 20 or a 25-year retirement. And so looking at different ways to monetize your home equity is a different way of thinking. And that's where I think people start getting confused on a reverse mortgage because in many cases, especially in Texas, you always hear that your home equity is very specific, it should be used for retirement, but yet how can you tap it? You really can't tap your home equity unless A, you sell your house, or B, you take out a, take out a home equity loan, but then you have to turn back around and access those funds and make monthly mortgage payments. So enter the reverse mortgage. Now, you also, when you hear reverse mortgage, you may hear the phrase HECM. HECM is Home Equity Conversion Mortgage, and that's what HUD calls these. So I just bring that up. But a reverse mortgage is a type of home equity loan that allows homeowners who are aged 62 and over, and it's 62, it's not 65, it's not 59, 62 or and over, which means both borrowers must be aged 62 and over, and it allows them the ability to borrow against the equity in their home without having to repay any of the mortgage debt during their lifetime. Now, normally this is where we start to lose people and it starts to get confusing because no one's ever bought a house, no one's ever bought a boat, no one's ever bought a car without having to make a traditional monthly mortgage payment or a monthly payment. So we'll talk about this, but the reverse mortgage is called a reverse mortgage which I think everybody can realize is a horrible name. It's a very confusing name. It sounds horrible. I mean, if we could have done it all over again, we certainly would have called it something other than a reverse mortgage. Because basically the traditional payback stream is reversed. In many cases, you can use a reverse mortgage to pay off an existing mortgage. You could take out your reverse mortgage in a lump sum payment. You could take out your reverse mortgage in a line of credit which I like because that way you only access funds if and when you need them and you don't have to pay interest on funds you don't need. Or you can take them out in a monthly payment. Now, this is where people get confused because I'm sure a lot of people see Fred Thompson and some of those other ads with all the actors and they talk about a reverse mortgage and they really talk about it as this, this great product and it's just it's better than sliced bread and everybody gets a reverse mortgage gets a free balloon and a cupcake and everybody lives happily ever after to some extent those ads are pretty good because it gives people an idea of what a reverse mortgage is but they talk about the fact that there's never a payment made and that's right and it's wrong and so let's talk a little bit about what a reverse mortgage is a reverse mortgage is no different than a traditional home equity loan that everybody on this call could go get today presuming you have the equity in your home. However, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, on an idea that President Reagan signed into law was the idea of aging in place. We have all this home equity and we're not really accessing it. What if you could take out a reverse mortgage, access your own home equity, live on that home equity, and then make the payment back, pay all of those payments back to your lender at the time you sell the house or pass away. Very different way to look at it. Most people are accustomed to taking out a mortgage and making a small payment every month for 180 or for 360 months. Then you own the home and you go down the road. Reverse mortgage is designed a little bit differently. Think about reverse mortgage when you go to dinner. Every time you go get a new salad or a new iced tea or a glass of wine, they don't bring you a bill. 
they bring you a bill at the end of dinner. To some extent, that's what a reverse mortgage is. It's a uniquely financed home equity loan. Or you could say it's a deferred payment home equity loan. The lender is still going to be paid, so it's not better than sliced bread. You still own your home, which is a giant misperception that somehow or another you may be selling your home to the lender. That is clearly not the case. But that you're gonna be in a situation where you can take out your loan, live on your home equity, and then at the time of death or sale or vacancy of the property, you'll pay the lender back. So that's normally when some people get thrown off in the left field and they don't come back because they've never really seen something like that. It sounds too good to be true. And so we'll just talk about that. And certainly I'll, I'll look on here. If anybody has any questions, be sure to bring some of these questions up. But think about it as a deferred payment home equity loan. The lender is still going to be paid. You're still going to pay the lender. However, you're just not going to pay the lender over a monthly basis. You're going to pay the lender in one lump sum payment in five or 10 or 15 years or however long you may live in the property, regardless of anything else. One thing that's very specific about a reverse mortgage is the way the loan can come back. Your only obligations are the payment of taxes and insurance on an annual basis. You never make a traditional principal and interest payment during the life of the loan. You're never going to make a monthly P&I payment. But you are, since you still own your home, title still in your name, you're still obligated to pay taxes and insurance as it, may, as it is on, a, on an annual level. That's it. Now, some of the Fred Thompson ads talk about no payments, and that's not completely right because you do have a payment of taxes and insurance. Where I come from, if I'm making a payment of taxes and insurance, that's still a payment. It may not be a principal and interest payment, but it is a payment. So don't let some of those ads throw you into left field. So think about that from that perspective. Um, Roxy, how are we doing? Are we doing all right? Yes, we just had a question. It says, what if the borrower lives longer and say the loan totals $100,000, but the value of the home when the borrower dies is only $75,000? Does the bank eat the loss? Okay, great, great question. Now, remember when we started, we talked about a reverse mortgage being a non-recourse loan. So it is conceivable if a borrower were to take out a reverse mortgage, and let's look at what happened in California in the years 2007, 2008, 2009, where the house had significant depreciation. And if you get in that scenario, it's certainly possible with a reverse mortgage that you could be underwater. And in this scenario, you owe, let's say, $100,000, but the property is only worth ninety. In that instance, because it is a FHA-insured loan, the lender, or really the federal government, would take that as a loss, and though that loss would not then be sent back to the heirs or the estate. And because it's an FHA loan, there is FHA insurance built into the product that covers that loss. So. A lot of people say, well, you know, what does happen if mom and dad, you know, are the kids going to get a $50,000 or $100,000 bill? And the short and the long answer is no, they will not because it's a non-recourse loan. Is it possible you could be underwater? Yes. You don't really see that much in Texas because Texas really never saw a significant depreciation. Clearly, there's some pockets where there was a little depreciation in Texas, but over a three or four year period of time, most of the time, the homes are either, either going to be even or they're certainly going to have seen some appreciation. And clearly, in the DFW area, I think most people would say they think the market's going to stay hot and remain hot for the foreseeable future. So that is possible. If that does happen, you don't have to worry about your children or your grandchildren receiving any of your debt. Roxy, do you have any other questions on that? That's the only question we have so far, Scott. Okay, per perfect, perfect. So oh, wait. when you talk okay, about a reverse go. mortgage, who is eligible? Now, we uh, talked about we this a little a, bit. Yes. All right. We just got another question. Here we go. Do both borrowers have to live in the home or just one? And what if one has to go to a nursing home? Great, great question. So let's talk about who is eligible. So at the offset, both borrowers must be age 62 and over. So if you have a 65-year-old borrower and a 55-year-old borrower, that wouldn't work. Both borrowers must be age 62 and over. It must be your primary residence. 
So no second homes, no investment properties, and yes, you can do condominiums. A reverse mortgage is gonna be the primary lien on the property. So if you do have an existing mortgage, what they'll do on the reverse mortgage, kind of like a cash out refinance, they're going to absorb the, your existing mortgage into the new reverse mortgage, which might not allow you to access any of your funds, but you're gonna pay off an existing mortgage. And that's important when we talk about the reverse mortgage for purchase, because it's going to give you a position where you never have to make another mortgage payment. And then the home should have at least 45% equity and that number in many cases can be as high as 50% equity. So like a home equity loan in Texas, you have to have existing equity in the property come to come to the table. But with a reverse mortgage, since in essence you're going to access part of your home equity in short to make your payments for you, the reverse mortgage is either designed for homes that are paid off or nearly paid off. So you really have to have roughly 45 to 50, 55% in the property and then, of course, remember it's a non-recourse loan. That's important because it really protects you and your heirs. Now, if a borrower does need to go into a nursing facility, that's fine because the way the Constitution is drafted, everything revolves around the surviving borrower or the second borrower. So if dad needs to move into a nursing facility and mom is still in the home, that's fine. The note doesn't come due and payable everything would still stay the same. Dad's in the nursing facility, mom's in the home. The only way a reverse mortgage can come due and payable and needs to be paid off is death of the surviving borrower, so both borrowers must pass away, just traditional sale of the home, like you'd have, you sell the home, pay off the lender, or vacancy of the home by both borrowers for over one year without the lender knowing where you are. So even if both borrowers, mom and dad, move into a nursing facility and you're letting the servicer know mom and dad are at XYZ nursing facility, we've paid taxes, we've paid insurance, which as we said are the two obligations you have, and then we've maintained the collateral, the home is still insured, the yard hasn't grown up around your hips, the servicer certainly can allow you to stay in the property longer. But that's important. That's the only way the note can come due and payable, presuming you're paying taxes and insurance. At no point can the lender come and show up at your mom and dad's house on their 100th birthday and say, Mimi and Papa, we didn't think you'd live this long. We're going to call the note. That cannot happen in the state of Texas. Really can't happen anywhere in the country, but we're talking about Texas today. So when you really think about a reverse mortgage, especially after this last legislative session, a reverse mortgage loan in Texas actually has more consumer protections in it than any mortgage loan in the entire country. Now let me say that again because most people would not understand that or believe that and it's one of the great trivia questions. But after Proposition 5 passed and the additional consumer protections we put into it, a reverse mortgage loan has more consumer protections than a home equity loan in Texas by significant number, and we're not aware of any other state, any other mortgage in the country that has the number of consumer protections than a reverse mortgage in Texas does. I bring that up because once again, we're talking about your clients, we're talking about your parents, we're talking about your family, and it is critically important that if we're talking about a home equity loan, we're talking about accessing your equity, that you need to understand that you're protected in the home, you're protected by the laws, you're protected by the Constitution, and that if mom or dad needs to move into a nursing facility, that does not trigger anything. Roxy, any question questions on that? Where, yes, yeah, ma'am. We have one more question about what is the maximum loan amount? Well, there is no, I, I'd say there is no maximum loan amount like a home equity loan. But since it is an FHA loan, the, the maximum, well, it, it's really a two-point question. The maximum home value is six twenty-five five. $625,500. Now you can still have a seven or eight or $900,000 home and take out a reverse mortgage. However, because the, the lending cap is going to be based on 6255, if you have an $800,000 house, you're really only being given credit for 625,000 of that. So some of that equity you still have clearly, 
but you just can't access that equity. So it's a little bit of a trick question. So the, the real answer to your question is 625.5, and if you have a house of 625.5, you really need to have a mortgage below $310,000 to make that work. So features. With a reverse mortgage, you always retain title. That is very important because that is the number one misperception. Somehow people always believe wrongly that if I take out a reverse mortgage, somehow or another I'm selling my house to the lender. Because if the lender is going to give me 50 cents on the dollar or a 50% loan to value, clearly somehow or another they're going to take the property. That is absolutely not the case. Think about a traditional mortgage. Think about a traditional home equity loan. You still own your home. You still retain title. You can sell it at any time without penalty. That's the same thing with a reverse mortgage. Now, let's think about when mom and dad might pass away. It's just like a traditional mortgage now. If, if mom and dad were to pass away today and they have a mortgage on it, traditionally, brother and sister probably would get together, hire a realtor, sell the home, pay back the lender, and then any of the equity goes back to the heirs of the estate. It's the same thing with a reverse mortgage. The lender does not share in the appreciation. The lender does not get anything other than the principal we gave you plus interest. So you could sell the home. You could take out a reverse mortgage today. You could turn back around in a month and sell the home pay the lender back principal interest closing costs and the equity goes back to the heirs of the estate. Now the amount of funds you can receive depends on, yes. Scott, we have another question here. It, uh, okay. what, happens if, if the, what happens if the surviving parent puts a child on the Title II? Would that name need to be removed for the parent to qualify for a reverse mortgage? Yes, yes it would. Both borrowers must be age 62 and over, and there's there's no no way around that. So if you have a child on title who is not age 62, they would have to be taken off of title. And then, so the funds you can receive depends on a number of things. It's the age of the youngest borrower, the appraised value of the home, and I say appraised value because your tax assessed value does not account They'll have an FHA appraisal of the property, the interest rate and the upfront costs, and the amount of any liens on the property, if any, which is important to note because if you have a lien on the property, we'll pay that lien off, and then you can move forward with a reverse mortgage. And then depending on your personality, your health situation, your financial situation, the funds that can be delivered to you or could be in a lump sum, a line of credit, fixed monthly payments, for as long as you live or for a set period of time. So you can take the, your funds in, in a number of different ways depending really on your personality and what you're really trying to get accomplished on it. So Another question when we talk about, Scott. yes, okay. Okay, if both parents go to a nursing home, can the house be occupied by a family member or can it be leased out? No, because it does have to be, it has to be your primary residence. Now, you'd want to certainly talk to your accountant as to, you know, you want to make sure you, you, you retain your homestead and your primary residence aspect of it. But traditionally what we've seen, this is what we've seen. When we, when we came up with the one-year scenario, once the house has been vacated, the statistics that we saw were really somewhat staggering. Once a borrower has left the home and has moved into a nursing facility for 60 days, they never return really it's almost depressing and so we kept it at a year which is far beyond anything I would tell you if, if I were advising you and mom and dad had both moved into the a nursing facility I would advise you you probably need to sell that property because you still have to maintain the collateral you have to keep it insured you have to pay taxes on it you have to maintain the collateral and so once both borrowers have moved into moved out of the house and moved into a nursing facility you really are, you, you know, depending on your situation, you're probably in a, in a scenario in which you need to sell that property and move on because it, it can't be an investment property because it has to be your primary residence. Okay, Scott, I got another question here. Uh, is this type okay. of loan available? Let me see, is this loan type only available to couples? Uh, 
only available to couples. No, I mean it could be available to individuals, and and you even have some scenarios where where two uh, two older sisters uh, might get a reverse mortgage. So, uh, you know, you could even have a scenario in which you know pe- people are trying to kind of combine in- incomes. I think you're starting to see more and more families get together and, and buy properties, and so it doesn't it doesn't have to be your traditional mom and dad. It could be an individual or sisters, or it could be anybody really looking to. Uh, who own who own the home, and it's just your primary residence. Okay, and we have another one here. Uh, it says they thought that the lump sum was just removed from options, and this was something that was told to one of their clients. Great, great question. There have been some significant changes to the reverse mortgage uh, product and how the payout comes out. The lump sum is still available. All the products are still available. What they have done is they have limited the amount you can access in the first year. You can still access the rest of your funds on day 366. But what they were saying is, you know, you can take your funds in a monthly payment or a lump sum payment or a line of credit. Most people were taking the funds in a lump sum. And we felt that that was problematic because many people maybe didn't have a financial advisor and maybe were spending too much money in the first year. And so the government decided, and I believe it's probably a pretty good idea, that they limit the amount of money you receive in the first year. So let's just say, for example, they've limited that number to 60% of a lump sum in the first year. So let's just say, for argument's sake, you originally were qualified last month for $100,000. Now you can access $60,000 in the first year and in the second or third or fourth year, you can access the other 40000 So you still get access to all your funds. You just don't have access to everything in year one. But, but absolutely, the lump sum payment is still available. And so that, that, that comment or that question is about half accurate. Scott, we have another one. Um, how okay. did you calculate the maximum proceeds, assuming the value is greater than or equal to $625,500? Well, let's just say somebody comes to me and says, I've got a $700,000 house. The first thing I know is that it's really not a $700,000 house. It's a $625,500 house. So you still have access to that equity, but I can't lend you, I can't lend any money to you on anything over the 6255 number. And so the actuaries, since a reverse mortgage is kind of a cross between a home equity loan and a long-term care policy, it's going to be based on actuaries. It's very much an insurance style product. And so we're going to take the age of the youngest borrower, what current interest rates are, and take the 625.5 and figure out your, calculate your loan to value there. So it's not like a home equity loan in that we know it's 60, you know, 80% right off the bat. With a reverse mortgage, it could be a 45% payout, it could be a 55% payout, but it's going to be dependent upon the age of the borrower, in particular the age of the youngest borrower. So the younger you are, the more money you're going to receive. So a 62-year-old borrower is going to get significantly less money than a 75 or an 80-year-old borrower. Scott, we have another question. Uh, If both borrowers are in a nursing home or pass away, how do their heirs keep the property or pay off the reverse mortgage? Can they pay it off like a traditional mortgage or must they pay it back in a lump sum? And what if they have bad credit and don't qualify for a mortgage loan? Do they lose their family home? Well, that's, that's, that's a good question. I mean, if, if mom and dad pass away and they have a mortgage loan on it, uh, it does come due and payable. And so, you know, traditionally, what you see is a brother or sister would get together and sell the property altogether. You could certainly pay cash for it and keep it. You could certainly refinance it and keep it. So you have some options. But if you have a house, let's say, that has been in the house for three or four generations and it's on the river, I would say you need to think about the reverse mortgage for the heirs. Uh, because obviously that note comes due and payable. And if you're not in a position to pay cash for it or refinance it, that but would become indeed problematic. I would say that the reverse mortgage is designed for the parents. Uh, I'm not a big believer that it's designed for the children other than it could be a resource 
for the children who are looking after mom and dad's best interest. But if you do have a home that's been in the family for a number of generations, I would certainly, uh, I, I wouldn't advise against a reverse mortgage, but I would certainly say you need to think about the, the back end of this. Are you in a position where you could buy the house or refinance it? Um, because once mom and dad pass away, the note does indeed come due and payable, and that's one of the only ways it can come due and payable. Scott, we have another question here, and I know you still have quite a few slides to get through, so let's have, let's do this question, and then um, we'll go through your slides, and hopefully we'll have time for more questions at the end. Uh, the next one is, so if 55% of equity is the maximum loan amount, assuming the loan amount is less than 625, doesn't Hmm. That doesn't exactly sound um, like a question. It says, so is 55% of the of equity the maximum loan amount, assuming the loan amount is less than 625.5? Well, I, I, I think I think let me let me I think what the question is basically saying. Let's take the 625.5 out because that that can be confusing if you have a seven eight hundred thousand dollar house. Let's take a hundred thousand dollar house today. I don't owe anything on it depending on your age, you're going to be able to access, you know, I say, you know, 45, 55%. Keep in mind, a good rule of thumb is is a 50% loan to value. So think about it this way. Home equity is 80, and that's, that's a firm number is 80. A reverse mortgage is 50, but that's not a firm number. Think about that as an, el an elastic number. The loan to value could be 47, 48%. It could be 52, 53%. It's going to be based on actuaries. So I have a hundred thousand dollar house. It's paid off free and clear. I can give you fifty thousand dollars in a number of different scenarios. And so think about it from that perspective. If you come to me and say I owe a hundred thousand dollar, I have a hundred thousand dollar house and I owe eighty thousand dollars on it, the reverse mortgage really would not work unless you were planning on coming to title with thirty thousand dollars to buy the loan down. So. And we can certainly answer some more questions because I do want to go through a few more of these slides. So what is a reverse mortgage? It is a funding source. It's a financial planning tool. It gives you an ability, unlike a home equity loan, to access your own home equity, monetize your home equity without having to turn back around and make monthly payments. So it's a liquidity issue, it's a cash flow issue. Now remember, no principal and interest payments are made, but you do have to pay taxes and insurance. That's critical because most people don't understand it. Now, as it relates to the heck of for purchase, which is why I'm sure a lot of you are on this call, remember this was a five-year project. It was recently approved by the Texas legislature with the support of the Texas Association of Realtors. Metrotex, by the way, supported this, AARP, every major newspaper in the Texas, and a vote of 170 to 1 by the legislature. It's coming soon. We believe it will be available uh, somewhere between two to four to five weeks from now. So this is certainly something possible that you could be looking into for your clients very soon. And so this is why we wanted to bring this to your attention today so you can start thinking about this as a different and a unique viable option for you. It is designed for borrowers who really traditionally are downsizing. So think about mom and dad, kids have gone. Let's say I want to move into Dallas because I want to be closer to medical care or the grandchildren. Or let's say I want to move out of Dallas because I want to move into more of a senior uh, facility or I want to move into maybe a smaller town and go play golf every day. And it's also designed for borrowers who traditionally are cash buyers or buyers who intend on putting down more than 50%. Because remember, the reverse mortgage is designed, the traditional reverse mortgage is designed for homes that are either paid off or nearly paid off. You need 50% equity in the property. The same thing would be applicable for the heck and for purchase. You need 50% in the property, which means you would have to have a down payment of at least 50% to make the reverse mortgage for purchase work. But this is where we start talking about those who are downsizing and those who are really specifically always cash borrowers or borrowers who are always going to put down a large down payment. So if a borrower was going to come to you and they were going to put down 10 or 20 percent, the reverse mortgage for purchase 
really is not applicable and would not apply to what you're trying to do. It's designed, doesn't mean it, it's for this, but traditionally the borrowers that take out the reverse for purchase, we're going to downsize and we're always going to pay cash. Now one Scott, reason this is get, something uh, that's in, yes. Scott, we have one more, it's kind of a, a addition to a question that was asked before. It says, oh, how, okay. soon does the note, how soon does the note come due once both borrowers pass away? In other words, how long do the heirs have in which to sell the home? That's a great question. And it, it's a, it's a two-point answer. The the way the law is written is that the the note comes due and payable upon the time the servicer is aware that the surviving borrower has passed away. But then you go on further. You really have nine months. You have six months to get the house listed and try to sell the property. And then if for some reason you can't sell it in that period, you go back to the lend, you go back to the servicer and ask for another three months. And then you can continue to ask the servicer for extensions, but what they're going to want to see is that are you making an effort to sell the property or refinance the property or liquidate the property in some way. Clearly the servicer doesn't want to go into a foreclosure and take the house. The other aspect that is important on this is that a, is that a reverse mortgage falls under what is called a judicial foreclosure by judicial review, which means you cannot foreclose on a reverse mortgage, a home with a reverse mortgage without a court order. So basically the lender can't say, your mom and dad died on a Monday, we're the lender, we win, you lose, we're gonna foreclose on you in 30 days. Absolutely cannot happen. Can't go, can't foreclose anyway without a court order. So the, the real, the, the short answer to your question is you have six months to sell the home and then you have another period of time, an additional three months, taking you out to nine. And then in many cases, you could go out as far as a year. But, you know, I think, and then obviously there are always going to be some certain situations. But the answer to your question is you basically have between six months and a year. Nine months is really where, if you haven't sold the house in nine months, I'm sure the servicer is going to come back and say, are you really trying to sell the home? Have you listed the home for what is a legitimate value? Or are you just trying to kind of game the system and beat the government and list the house for a million dollars when it's only worth three hundred thousand dollars? So those are some questions you would have with the servicer. But remember, you have the Constitution behind you and you have a court order behind you that uh, that would certainly protect everybody in, in, in the game. Now, why is the reverse mortgage for purchase important for Texas? We've already told you about the retirement crisis. We've already told you about the fact that Texas is going to continue to age. Today in Texas, 22, 23% of all homes are owned by individuals age 65 or over. Now remember, this is 65, but the reverse for purchase, both borrowers have to be 62. So if you look at those numbers, about one in four homes in the entire state of Texas are all owned by people age 65 and over certainly well over a million three and this number is going to grow every day so there is lots of opportunity to come in front of a lot of new borrowers who may not be aware of what a reverse mortgage is certainly may not be aware of what a reverse mortgage for purchase is unless they're extremely well read and really paid a lot of attention to what the legislature was doing so when you think about a reverse mortgage this for, for purchase it is important from this aspect to remember this is a cash flow aspect. I am trying to find different ways to manage my retirement, manage my assets, and manage my monthly cash flow. Today in Texas, I'm gonna go buy a $300,000 house. Traditionally speaking, I have two options. I can pay cash, which is great if you have it, or like a lot of people, I probably have sold my home, I'm buying a new home, so I'm going to take out a new 30-year fixed rate. Let's just say in this example, I'm either going to pay cash of $300,000 or I'm going to put down a down payment of 50%, in this case $150,000, take out a 30-year fixed rate, which is going to cost me about $782 a month. So after seven years, I'm going to have to have paid about $65,000 for a mortgage. So. From your perspective, you have a couple of different ways to look at this. If you go to a borrower, I mean, one easy litmus test on this is the reverse for purchase gives you this opportunity. 
if I could let you buy the same home, but yet save $782 a month, would that be a benefit to your family? And I believe the answer needs to be yes or no. 782, you know, after seven years, 84 months, that's $65,000. Remember, it's expensive to grow old in Texas, and if I could just save you $65,000 or defer that $65,000 because you're still going to pay it, remember, you're just not going to pay it on a monthly payment basis, you're gonna pay it when you sell the property years later, be it 5, 10, 12, 17 years, whatever that number may be, if I could free up that type of money for you, would that be a benefit? And it's either yes or no. Now that's on the monthly payment for those borrowers who are always going to take out a monthly payment. But think about the cash borrower now. So I was gonna pay $300,000 to pay cash, maybe, so I don't have to have a mortgage payment. What if you could go to that same borrower and say, I can let you buy this same house, but instead of paying 300,000 cash and not having a payment, you could put down $150,000 and not have a payment. Now, in this example, it's 50% down payment. Remember, depending on the age of the borrowers, the older you are, the better it is, the down payment could be 45%, it could be 55%. So remember, when I say 50%, that's a rule of thumb, that's not a hard number. But in this scenario, so if you go back to that same borrower, and now you've had the ability to save him or her or them $150,000, litmus test two is would that be a benefit for your family and I think the answer to that needs to be yes or no the other thing you could do if you're really entrepreneurial is you could say look you are going to go pay three hundred thousand dollars anyway you're always going to pay cash you're going to buy a house for three hundred thousand dollars instead of paying three hundred thousand dollars on a three hundred thousand dollar house why don't you go buy a four hundred thousand dollar house which by the way is a 33% larger sale for you, put down the $300,000 and then take out a reverse you know, mortgage for $100,000 without having to make a mortgage payment. You've allowed them to go buy a bigger house with the same down payment they were always gonna make and they never had to make a monthly mortgage payment. So. It's just a different way to look at retirement. It's a different way to look at your cash reserves, your cash, cash assets. I'm not here to say it's the best product in the world or a bad product, but when you start looking at the retirement crisis in Texas, a reverse mortgage for purchase is clearly a different way to say, this allows you to age in place, buy a newer home that may be more senior oriented for you, may be closer to the grandchildren, maybe closer to medical care, because clearly those are probably the two driving forces. You are always gonna sell your house, you are always going to pay cash. This allows you to still retain some of that cash, not have a P&I payment, or possibly go buy a larger house than you'd anticipated that might get you closer to the golf course or closer to your grandchildren, and you still kind of have the best of both worlds. So I know we're running tight on time. Uh, Roxy, Scott, let me right open up at, that for. Yeah, Scott, we're right at three minutes until we finish. So, um, okay. Do you, would you mind Would you mind giving your phone number out to anybody that might yeah, want to? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do that right now. Let me Let me give you two okay. numbers. One is my phone number. It's five one two four two three four five four five. Or the easiest way is uh, Scott dot Norman at Cente, S-E-N-T-E, mortgage.com. Uh, we've got two offices, two offices in the DFW area, uh, and we can certainly answer any of your questions, but uh, scott.norman at Cente, mortgage.com, or 512-423-4545, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.